Why do people kill? If there's one thing I've learned in my time as a crime writer, it's that there are a million and one motives for murder. But in the case of a serial killer, what could be the motive for not one, but a lifetime of murders? Power, corruption, blackmail, or maybe the most common one of all, money, or more precisely, greed. You have many people who say hell doesn't exist. That when people die, they just sleep. The thought that there is no physical place called hell is foolishness. Even professing Christians want to explain it away and soften it up. Instead of telling and preaching it for what it is. A place of eternal torment. A place of eternal fire. A place that you don't want to go. Jesus spoke about hell more than he did heaven. The same place that far too many people are going because they love their sin and darkness. If sin and darkness is what you love, sin and darkness is what you will get. These are some of the terms Jesus used. Everlasting fire, everlasting punishment, eternal condemnation, the fire that should never be quenched, their worm does not die, unquenchable fire. People don't want to believe in hell because they don't truly fear, they don't truly respect God, they don't truly know God only a piece of him and whatever else they decide to add or subtract to make God in their image. A symbol of greed and brutality, Attila's thirst for power was unmatched and he's rumored to have killed his own brother to take sole control of the Huns. Called the Scourge of God, he was a fair leader to his own people, but the rest of the Roman Empire wasn't so lucky. To them, he was a barbarian who destroyed entire towns and tortured and mercilessly killed his victims. We wish we could say the self-proclaimed president for life was only responsible for economic breakdown, political authoritarianism, corruption, and nepotism. But human rights violations, ethnic cleansings, and mass murder can also be traced to his regime, with between 100 and 500,000 deaths attributable to him. As if that wasn't bad enough, the butcher of Uganda was also a rumored cannibal. Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things, and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee. Neither shall mine eyes spare, neither will I have any pity. As dictator, Pol Pot attempted to return Cambodia to its rural roots by forcing city residents to toil on collective farms. Though it held power four years, his communist Khmer Rouge party caused approximately two million deaths with politically motivated murders, torture, forced labor, disease, and food shortages, the victims of which were buried in the killing fields. He clung to nominal power until his 1998 death. Ivan the Terrible waged a 40-year war on his own country, 
Russia. Thousands were slaughtered. He devised cruel, sadistic punishments in his personal torture chamber. He watched prisoners flayed, boiled, and even fried. Execution, torture were absolutely routine in 16th century Europe. But somehow with Ivan, it goes a little bit beyond standard routines of a, a strict, even brutal ruler. Ivan destroyed villages, towns, and an entire city. He stabbed his son to death in a fit of rage. All in the name of God. Yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you, will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. people you have to impale to get the nickname the impaler? About a hundred thousand. And it's a particularly slow and painful way to go. If you really wanted to make an example of you, he'd take this rounded end and he'd grease it and then he'd pull your legs apart and insert it into your rectum. So through your bottom and gradually the stake would work its way through your body. This might take a couple of days, okay, so you'd be literally dying for hours. While Adolf Hitler may be the traditional choice for worst World War II villain, he initially commanded the admiration of his countrymen by helping Germany rise from the ashes of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. Himmler, on the other hand, was as interested in creating a master Aryan race. That led him to be Hitler's right-hand man, an SS and Gestapo leader, the head of concentration camps and the final solution, and ultimately, one of the main engineers of the Holocaust. Many historians believe it was not the work of a crazed psychopath, but an ambitious and driven man, determined to carry out what he saw as a vital mission for his country. The wife of the commander of two notorious concentration camps, Koch tortured and defiled prisoners and enjoyed selecting those destined for the gas chambers. Supposedly, she also cut tattoos from dead prisoners to keep as souvenirs. Convicted of crimes against humanity after World War II, she later hung herself in prison. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ilse was charged with personally selecting prisoners for murder. A gruesome selection of skins and shrunken heads were shown to the court. She denied everything and claimed she had been framed by the Allies. Crowds gathered outside the courtroom, calling for her execution. She was sentenced to life imprisonment. By 1967, Ilse had been in prison for 24 years. During this time, she'd shown no remorse or sorrow. On the 1st of September, she knotted some bedsheets together and hanged herself. She was 61 years old. In a final letter, she'd written, There is now no other way for me. Death is the only deliverance.
Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Rome has a history of unhinged emperors. Caligula's rule started out okay, but soon his brutality, recklessness, and sexual depravity won. He apparently opened a brothel in the palace, committed incest with his sisters, and made his horse a priest. His desire to be treated as a god and hobby of violently murdering his enemies made him so popular he was the first Roman emperor to be assassinated. Throughout his reign, the emperor took a keen interest in inflicting death. He issued precise instructions. Prisoners should be killed slowly by a series of small cuts. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. She is one of the only female serial killers. Warnos was abused during childhood and eventually became a prostitute to support herself. She went to jail multiple times for robbery, assault, and more, but her murders began in 1989. While her story often changed, Warnos claimed all her victims tried to rape her before she shot them. By 1993, she was convicted of six murders and she was executed by lethal injection nine years later. In 2003, Warnos's life story made it to the big screen, with Charlize Theron taking on the role of a monster. To me, this world is none but evil, and all of us are full of evil one way or another. To me, this world is none but evil, and all of us are full of evil one way or another. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. Law student Bundy used his charm and good looks to lure multiple women to their deaths. The turning point in his life came when he was dumped by his first love. His first confirmed murders took place in the mid-1970s, and he continued to evade police across multiple states for years by using his forensic knowledge. To gain his victim's trust, he dressed as an authority figure or with a cast. He then hit them over the head, raped, and then strangled them. Bundy blamed pornography for his crimes, and he admitted to over 30 murders, though many have not been confirmed. He died in the electric chair in 1989. I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Ridgway was violent in his youth. At age 16, he stabbed a six-year-old who survived. He eventually began frequenting prostitutes despite unwavering religious beliefs. In fact, many of his murder victims from the 80s and 90s were prostitutes or runaways whom he picked up, had sex with, strangled, then dumped near the Green River. After being suspected and cleared early in the investigation, Ridgway was finally arrested in 2001. He then confessed to 71 unconfirmed murders and was sentenced to 48 consecutive life terms in 2003. This Wisconsin native inspired not one, but three of the most famous movie killers. The effeminate Gain grew up with a deep attachment to his abusive mother, and he eventually decided he wanted to become a woman. Only three murders were actually attributed to him, but he was terrifying because he robbed graves and murdered in order to form a woman suit he could wear. When authorities searched his house after his capture, they found paraphernalia made of human body parts littering his home. Gain died of cancer while incarcerated for one murder in a mental institution in 1984. Gacy is why we're all afraid of clowns. 
This seemingly upstanding citizen dressed up as Pogo the Clown for local children's parties. However, behind the scenes, he molested teens who worked for him, in addition to other crimes. He spent 18 months in jail for sodomy before he moved and continued assaulting young boys. The murders began in 1972. He mostly assaulted, then strangled employees of his landscaping company and other male youths, then buried them around his house. He was finally arrested at the end of 1978 and was convicted of 33 murders two years later. Gacy was executed by lethal injection in 1994. What was your initial emotional response. Just to throw him down the crawl space. Get rid of him. Even once you bury somebody, it was already gone. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Dahmer first became known to police as a registered sex offender. However, the murders began in 1978. Dahmer often picked up his male victims in gay bars and had sex with them before drugging and killing them. When the police finally searched his apartment, they found decomposing corpses and body parts, as well as photos of his victims in various states of torture. Dahmer is also said to have engaged in both necrophilia and cannibalism. In 1992, he was sentenced to 15 life terms, but he was beaten to death by a fellow inmate two years into his term. Inside Dahmer's apartment, the bodies began to pile up. So he bought a 57-gallon drum and filled it with a powerful acid to dissolve the dismembered limbs and torsos. After weeks in the acid, the remains of Dahmer's would-be lovers became sludge, which he flushed down the toilet or the bathtub drain. On top of the necrophilia and cannibalism, he also dreamed of turning his victims into sex zombies by pouring boiling water or acid into their brains while they were still alive. I should have stayed with God. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. I should have stayed with God. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In a remote village in deepest Siberia, everyone knew Grigory Efimovich. As a teenager, his shameless exploits had earned him a reputation as a thief, a drunkard, and a womanizer. His name comes from the Russian word Rasputne, which means dissolute. So he obviously spent many of his um, childhood years getting drunk and getting up to no good. By the time he was in his teenage, he was a sort of tearaway. I mean, there was a sort of gang of toughs in the village, and he was the leader. So much so that uh, they would be paid by the... Um, priest to stay away from Sunday worship, for example, because they were so disruptive. Unwelcome in the Orthodox Church, Rasputin began to search for an alternative path to God. Evidently, he showed tremendous interest and curiosity and a deep um, sense of spirituality which others witnessed. So he was on the way to becoming um, a, an important figure in the religious scene of Russia at the time. Rasputin was never um, ordained priest and he didn't become a monk, although on occasion he claimed to or pretended to be that. Rasputin discovered a heretical cult who believed that only after a man had sinned greatly could he truly be repentant and pleasing to God. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. He's really the member of a sect, of which there were many in Russia. Rasputin's sect, probably the Hlisti as they are known. We translate that as the flagellants, the idea that they, they whipped themselves into a state of ecstatic frenzy where they had religious visions. And they, like many sects, believe that Christ was embodied in ordinary peasant people. The Hlisti rituals consisted of uh, meeting in secret places, forest glades perhaps, or cellars, where they would whip and dance and twirl and stamp and chant themselves into a state of ecstasy, into a frenzy. In Russian it's called radienia. They would then um, engage in group sex, in orgies, 
And the purpose of this was both to indulge in the sin of the flesh, in order then to be purified, to repent, and to abstain once again. Assuming the role of holy man and healer, Rasputin set about corrupting countless God-fearing peasant women. He could argue, you know, if you, you know, God, if you want to come to Christ, you want to come to God, then you have to sin first. And I can be your, the medium through which you can sin. And it's documented that many women fell for this line. His technique was quite straightforward and uncomplicated. He would simply tear open the girl's blouse. It's a very crude and primitive male chauvinism that he practiced. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Empress was desperate for someone to heal her son, the Tsarevich Alexis, because she had brought haemophilia into the Romanov family through her own family of Hesse. She saw her son's illness, the first male heir to be born, as a punishment from God. In November 1906, Rasputin was summoned to the royal palace at Zaskoselo to see if his mystical ability to heal could help. It seems that he was able to stop the bleeding of Tsarevich on occasion, whether this was by hypnotism or by simply his presence, which, which seemed to have a calming effect, or whether it was because he comforted the mother who was hysterical. With the illness of Alexei becoming progressively worse, the Empress was convinced that only a miracle could save her son. An incident in 1912 really sort of fixed his position there. The Empress was out riding with Alexis and he had some sort of fall and the internal bleeding began. In her desperation, the Empress telegrams Rasputin, who's at home in his village in Western Siberia. And by return, he sends a telegram back saying, God has heard your prayers and seen your tears. The little one will not die. Tell the doctors not to bother him too much. Miracle of miracles, the next morning he recovers, the bleeding stops. That sealed it for Alexandra, a miracle had occurred. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. In the small hours of a cold December night in 1916, Rasputin was driven to the palace of the Tsar's cousin, Prince Yusupov, for what he thought was a secret tryst with a beautiful woman. When he turned up in his shiny silk shirt, best leather boots, ready to meet this beautiful hostess, he was invited down into the basement and given poisoned Madeira. It didn't seem to have any effect on him. He was given some cakes which had cyanide. Again, it, the guy seemed to be as robust as ever. At this point, Yusupov becomes impatient, goes to his office, collects a pistol, comes down again, shoots Rasputin twice in the side. Rasputin falls to the ground, they believe he's dead and the conspirators take away his coat. In their absence, he gets up again, staggers out of the doorway into the courtyard where he's found and shot again. They begin to think that he's actually the devil incarnate and they can't get rid of him. They begin to think that he's actually the devil incarnate and they can't get rid of him. Yusupov's frustration was so great that he allegedly castrated the man he referred to as Satan. They start beating him with a rubber um, truncheon and kicking him. Um, they finally get him into a car. They then drive him away and dump him in the river, where he's washed up a couple of days later. Grigory Rasputin was finally dead. 
Rasputin's body was later exhumed and burnt by the revolutionaries as a symbol of the complete annihilation of Russian imperial government. Tudor was the most hated queen in British history. During her five-year reign, she threw all England into chaos. Mary beheaded traitors, murdered heretics, and had pregnant women burnt to death in the name of her religious fanaticism. The entire nation lived in fear of her. Make no mistake about it. The burning of somebody at the stake is a very nasty business. It takes a long time to die. The smell of human burning fat would have been overpowering. There were nearly 300 burnt in about three and a half years in Mary's reign, which was actually more than the Spanish Inquisition and the French Chambre Ardente put together in the same period. Thousands fled into hiding and the streets of English cities were polluted with the putrid smell of burning flesh. She created such terror that she's known as Bloody Mary. Kings and queens have been known to kill at the drop of a hat. Mary I of England, also known as Bloody Mary, was more systematic. Wanting to restore Catholicism to England, she simply burned a bunch of Protestants. Wanting to restore Catholicism to England, she simply burned a bunch of Protestants. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Two hundred and eighty-three to be exact. Her most heartless murder may have been that of the Archbishop of Canterbury. He renounced Protestantism and rejoined the Catholic faith, but she went ahead and burned him anyway. Not bloody sporting. She was no old painting, but there are many more reasons why it would be hard to paint a pretty picture of the life and times of Amelia Dyer. Amelia Dyer killed for money. Nothing new in that, even in Victorian England. But what is astonishing about Amelia is that all of her victims were newborns. Amelia Dyer delivered, fostered and adopted illegitimate babies for money. If you gave her five pounds and the baby, she would take the baby and either have it adopted out or raise it herself. But of course what she really did was kill it and take the five pounds. Amelia Dyer was a murderer and she knew what she was doing. This was a calculated career plan that she'd embarked on and sustained over 30 years, come what may. She say she felt peaceful after she put the baby's body in the, in the river. She used to look at them and derive some kind of pleasure and some kind of perverted maternal perspective on these babies who she just killed. You know, as, a, as they're lying there, she gets some kind of glue. Using many aliases and addresses, Amelia Dyer evaded detection for decades, despite complaints of police in the pursuit of young mothers desperate to know the fate of their babies. She disposed of a lot of them straight away by throwing them in, in rivers. But we also believe that she kept hold of the parcels for a while until the bodies decomposed so that there would be no chance of the babies being traced back to her. The letters that survive tell of an articulate, persuasive and plausible woman rather than a savage butcher who killed and killed again for a period of 30 years. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. In 1990, Canadians Carla Homolka and her future husband Paul Bernardo raped Homolka's own sister, then let her choke to death on her own vomit. Not satisfied, the pair raped and killed two other teenagers over the next couple of years. Claiming she was forced to kill by Bernardo, Homolka copped a manslaughter plea. 
By the time videotaped evidence proved she was no victim, it was too late, and she got away with a 12-year sentence. Carla had misled the authorities about her involvement in the crimes. On the videos, she was seen fully participating in the attacks. Had the tapes surfaced earlier, they could have affected her infamous plea deal. The love of a mother is a great thing, except when taken to extremes. Case in point, Leonardo Cianciulli. In Italy, in the late 1930s, Cianciulli's son was drafted. Believing only human sacrifices could keep her sunny boy safe, she brutally killed three of her neighbors. She then boiled them and turned them into tea cakes and soap, spawning her nickname, the Soap Maker of Correggio. Derided by the press as the most evil woman in Britain, Myra Hindley and her partner Ian Cross carried out the Moors murders in the early 1960s. Their victims, whom they also tortured and sexually assaulted, were five children and teenagers. Hindley's coldness and indifference to her deeds made her one of the most reviled women in the country until her death in 2002. Some people just can't hold their arsenic. Just ask Marianne Cotton, a notorious 19th century British serial killer who even inspired a child's nursery rhyme. Cotton is estimated to have poisoned as many as 21 people, including 12 of her own children, three husbands, her mother, and a lover. But the hangman got back at her. Legend has it he intentionally used the wrong length of rope so her death would be longer and more painful. Gunnis is thought to have killed at least 25 people, but the real number might actually be closer to 40. She killed her own children, as well as a long string of gullible husbands and suitors. Jim Jones People's Temple started as a multicultural communist group out to help the poor. But under Reverend Jones, the organization tightened its grip on disciples and predicted a coming nuclear apocalypse. After fleeing to Guyana, the cult leader saw to the murder of American authorities sent to check them out and convinced over 900 followers to drink cyanide-laced Kool-Aid, marking one of the largest mass suicides in history. A Hungarian countess of the 16th and 17th centuries, she enjoyed luring young women to her castle to torture, mutilate, and kill them, just for kicks. The estimated number of her victims goes as high as 650. Legend has it that Bathory bathed in the blood of her victims. got a clean copy of it now, and uh, I warn you, uh, this could scare you. Here's the email. Dear Art Bell, I just recently began listening to your radio show and could not believe it when you talked about the sounds from hell tonight. My uncle had told me this story a couple of years ago, and I didn't believe him. 
like one of your listeners who discounted the story as nothing more than just a religious newspaper fabricated account. The story about the digging and hearing of the sounds from hell is very real. It did occur in Siberia. My uncle collected video and so forth on the paranormal, supernatural. He passed away fairly recently. But he would have loved your show. He let me listen to one of the audio tapes that he had on the sounds from hell in Siberia, and I copied it. He received his copy from a friend who worked at the BBC. It took me a while to find it tonight, but attached is that sound from my uncle's tapes. It's not the greatest quality, but the sounds are there. I was very hesitant to send you this, as the sound bothers me to listen to. I'd suggest that if you do play it on the program, warn listeners in advance so they may have the option of turning the radio off for 30 seconds while it plays. It has always haunted me. To those who discounted the Siberia sounds from Hell's story, it is true, and I, for one, wish it wasn't. Rick, listening from Chicago. And so I submit now the cleaned, uh, a better copy to you, and uh, I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. <laughs> And our whole life change We used to be a team I'm the muscle You would be the brains Since I'm the brains of the operation I'm shutting it down Whatever I guess I'll find another way to put it Said down I don't know I don't know What has gotten into me This could be the end of May Let's get this I become money. my own enemy In the May In the May And I have so much have so Negative much. energy Negative energy from this demon trapped inside of me I'm not a demon It's me, my own enemy, enemy, enemy